This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. We have just launched a new program for supporters of the Unregistered Podcast. If you go to unregisteredlisteners.com, you'll find a whole new set of packages for people who can support the podcast in various ways. We're offering brand new packages of benefits to those who help the podcast. Members of the Unregistered Underground, which is the supporting listeners group for the podcast, will be able to participate in the Renegade University 2.0 beta launch. We're building right now a brand new platform, a Renegade University. And if you join, you'll be one of the very first people to test the brand new website and the new platform that we've been building for you for the last year. You'll also have access to the Unregistered Underground private Facebook group, where we have a lot of fascinating and contentious and fun debates and discussions about all sorts of issues related to the podcast and anything else. You'll also be able to participate in exclusive Ask Me Anything live sessions with me. We're also offering several free new courses from Renegade University for supporting listeners, including the most popular course in Renegade University history, my What is Postmodernism video course. Unregistered underground members at higher levels can receive the Renegade History of the United States video course, which is a multi-episode video version of my book. You can also receive a free copy of my course on World War II called The Great Blowback, in which I argue that many of the 65 million people who were killed in World War II were killed as a result of U.S. intervention. At the very highest level, the renegade level, you can also get the free courses Afghanistan, America's Longest Foreign War, a course taught by the great Scott Horton, as well as his course The War on Terror, and my course on the history of American foreign policy, Dangerous Nation. Go to unregisteredlisteners.com to become a supporting member of this podcast. We need you to keep going. We need you to make this podcast what you want it to be. And thank you to everyone who has supported it so far. It has meant everything to me. For the next two weeks, anyone who joins the brand new Unregistered Underground Supporter Listeners Group gets up to 25% off both monthly and annual memberships. Just go to unregisteredlisteners.com and join. Thank you so much. What is it like for an opponent of the American empire to sit and work and operate and think and talk publicly just a few blocks from the seat of that very empire? This is my interview with John Glazer, the Director of Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. So I'm in a place where I'm not supposed to be, which is a think tank on Capitol Hill within walking distance of the White House. And I'm in a, one of those big glass brick office buildings on Massachusetts Avenue with a guy in a business suit. And we're going to talk about foreign policy for a while. And this is the closest I ever thought I'd get to the White House in some ways. And it's the closest I ever thought someone with my ideas about foreign policy would get to the White House too. And that's you, John Glazer. Uh, someone I've been following for a long, long time. I can't remember when I first read your stuff, but it was many years ago. And you've been a very consistent anti-interventionist, anti-war, anti-imperialist, dove analyst uh, on foreign policy. 
with ve various venues. Now you're with Cato Institute, and that's where we are. Uh, but I don't think I've ever seen anybody as anti-interventionist as you this close to power. Is that fair to say? That might be true. Um, hmm. I have a colleague here, John Mueller. Mm -hmm. he, he comes from academia, so he's not a think tanker. But uh, he might even beat me out in dovishness. Really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, we'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see. I think I'm going to beat you out, actually. Okay. But um, so here's a question I have for you, which I've always had for myself and I've had for other people who are interested in this weird thing called foreign policy is why, why do you care? Well, you know, from a libertarian standpoint. Don't uh, start there. Yeah, I shouldn't start, start with the Start label. from the John standpoint. Well, look, um, there's a lot of things I don't like about concentrations of power. Um, hmm. And it's true that when you really look at it, um, you know, state action it has force and coercion behind it, no matter what the context. But with foreign policy, we're literally talking about bombs and bullets. Mm -hmm. And so the force and coercion is very real and very, um, very apparent. And Although a, an uptick in the marginal income tax rate might have some effects uh, or some other sort of anodyne clinical policy that we can chat about domestically uh, might have some negative impacts. But, uh, you know, our foreign policy kills people, and that seems to me important. Well, so that's what I hear, bombs and bullets, yeah. real and apparent, you said, but not for you. Right. Not for me. That's true. Not for Scott Horton. Your former colleague, my friend. Right. Not for mm -hmm. really any anti war person I know now. And so, why? If you have never experienced it, I don't think. As it, were you ever in the service or anything? No. no. So, and I haven't in any way ever experienced war. Yeah. Why do we care? Why do you care? I still don't, I don't get it. Well, I don't, I don't know if I can sort of uh, specify philosophically and ethically why it bothers me that mm. the government I pay for in part uh, causes human pain and suffering but it does and that affects me and I don't like it um, <laughs> uh, that's one part of it yeah. you know there are there are other aspects but uh, it should mess with people's heads that in the 90s, we had a sanctions policy on Iraq that killed 500,000 people. Mm. It should bug people that the United States, while it punishes other countries for its, their transgressions of international law and norms, it routinely violates them, including by attacking other countries and upending entire regions and um, killing hundreds of thousands of people, et cetera. Um, you know, that, that has an impact. Mm -hmm. You want people to be bothered by this? Why? Well, I, frankly, I think most of them, most people would be bothered by it if they knew about it. Oh. Uh, right. But, um, I mean, it... hopefully. That, that's a hopeful uh, prediction. However, they don't know about it. So I was just reading about Somalia, for example. Uh, Donald Trump, as president, has continued... Obama's expansion of the bombing campaign on Somalia. Now, how many Americans do you think know about this? Mm -hmm. I think very few. About five. Yeah. Uh, but if they were aware, or if they were more aware, for example, of what we're doing in Yemen, that our actions, the actions of our government, are directly leading to uh, massive human suffering, the most acute humanitarian crisis in the world right now is in Yemen. Uh, millions of people on the verge of starvation, Tens of thousands dead because mm -hmm. of uh, our support of the Saudi air campaign and blockade. You know, I think if they knew, I think if people knew that, they might also uh, want it to stop. It's too hard, John. It's too, it's too big of a world. It's too many places. It's too many names, languages, and people. <sighs> Military services, Navy, Army. I can't keep track of all that special ops. I mean, it's a lot, right? And it's a big globe, and we have TV to watch. Yeah, mostly I don't blame people for their ignorance because uh, it's a it's a morbid and things are good for us. We have not had bombs dropped on us, right? Yeah, so I don't see a reason for why Americans should care. Frankly, do you care? Yeah, why? 
I don't know and it's not good for me. I wish I didn't. It's not good that you don't know or? No, it's not good for me that I do care. Right. It's very bad for me personally. I am yeah. very bothered by it in very real and apparent ways. Well, we're that, in the same boat. Then. That are, yeah, yeah. And I don't get it. Like, I wish I could just excise it from my from my character, my personality, but I can't. And it, it tortures me, actually. And I also feel, on top of that, and I know you have this same, same experience, feeling alone with it mm -hmm. is the worst part, right? And you, even as a libertarian working at a libertarian think tank, uh, are pretty alone even here on this stuff, right? Because you were telling me before we turned the mics on that even, even among libertarians in Washington, D.C., they're not terribly interested in foreign policy at all. That's right. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, that's the worst thing the state does. Yeah. We all agree, is go to war. But they don't care? Why? I also don't have the answer to that. I could speculate that the kind of titans in the libertarian canon were theorists and political scientists and economists that didn't tend to focus on foreign policy and therefore it's kind of blinded uh, a lot of libertarians. So this is an area I don't really know about. There's another factor, which is simply that um, it seems that being born in a country has the ability to make you believe that whatever it does abroad is the picture of benevolence and goodness. Isn't that amazing? It's profound. Yeah. Uh, it's really amazing. People identify with their nation for no good reason. And they do it in ways that are so profound. It really fundamentally shapes their views of the world. Yeah, it does. And their own lives. Yeah. It's remarkable, but there is this automatic assumption among people of almost every nation, right, uh, that their nation is the right one and the good one. And either, maybe it's corrupted in the moment, but it should it can return to its glorious past. Right. But the nation, the idea of this nation, the essence of it, is always good or often good for people. Right. In regardless of the nation they're actually in. Right. So if you if your nation happens to be the greatest superpower in the history of the world, right, then yeah, man, it's great that we live in an American world. Right. Yeah, and I think it's particularly strong that tendency in America because the foreign policy we have has its origins uh, in large measure uh, in the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, that rests in people's minds as a clear example of good versus evil. And that Manichaean uh, narrative stretches all the way to today uh, for, for a lot of people. And so... Um, since our current grand strategy was kind of born in blood against the most obviously mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. evil bad guy in the world or in, in history, uh, it's, it reinforces the already existing tendency to have a tribal um, belief in, in your government's benevolence. We were the heroes of the 20th century. Right. Let's think about that for a second. I never, I've never put it that way, but that's right. That's the way that history has been written sort of on a grand scale, right? Yeah. That's the way we think about it kind of on a meta level. As Americans, we were the good guys, the heroes, the victors, the saviors of the 20th century for the whole world. That's a big deal. <laughs> it's funny coming out of my mouth. To even, I mean, it's true, though. But that's the way that we think as Americans right. of ourselves as a nation generally. Yeah. I, actually, I wrote a paper on this uh, that's sort of similar that uh, because – after World War II, we, we adopted this really expansive grand strategy that said basically every nook and cranny of planet Earth mm -hmm. is of vital strategic importance to us. Um, and we have never kind of rolled that back. And even at the end of the Cold War, when our main geopolitical enemy just disappeared, which is another way of saying we got much safer than we ever were, mm -hmm. um, we didn't retrench. We didn't reevaluate. We, we instead expanded this strategy. And some people, you know, like IR theorists, real realists, international realists, yeah. international relations theorists, right? Yes, Structure something called structural realism, which says that the reason we didn't retrench after we lost all of our enemies and we were the most powerful country in the world by leaps and bounds, is because there were no external constraints on our power. No other powerful country could check our ability to meddle in their area, and so 
you know, when you don't have constraints, you go abroad. Um, other people point to, um, uh, other people just believe, actually most people in this town believe very strongly that that expanded grand strategy, maintaining troops overseas, uh, 800 bases in 80, 70 or 80 countries abroad. We have, we are treaty bound to defend 60 nations and uh, we have additional non-treaty allies who we promise to, to defend. All that, they think, has created a peaceful world, a stable one, and a prosperous one. And so that's why we didn't change routes. I obviously disagree with that. Right. But in my, in my paper, I, I look at all these explanations. Another one is sort of parochial, bureaucratic, um, military-industrial complex incentives and, and things like that. I think a lot of it is our status. Uh, it's sort of psychologically deflating to retreat or it's seen as a forfeit if we say we no longer have to be the dominant power in Europe and Asia. We can pull back and sort of mind our own business. People, people associate that with some kind of defeat or forfeit or loss and it's a hit to our prestige and so on. I think that really has propelled our foreign policy in ways that uh, is underappreciated. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, Vietnam can't happen again, can it? Although there's an there's a debate as to whether Vietnam was actually a loss. You know, Chomsky has argued that Vietnam was actually a victory because it sent a very clear message to anyone in the third world. If you want to fuck with the United States, we'll kill two million of you. Yeah. You may win the war, but we'll kill two million of you while you're doing it. I'm not sure that signal... Um was received by everybody. <laughs> no, um, no. But Vietnam is a good example. You know, by because the Pentagon Papers were leaked, we mm -hmm. know that internal documents, officials were talking by 1964 about most of the reason we're in this war is not to achieve our objectives as publicly stated, but to avoid the humiliation of defeat. That's a direct quote. Mm. Well, we could litigate the Vietnam War history here, uh, <laughs> but I won't. But I will say this: I am working on a, a chapter for my book on Vietnam, and it's pretty clear to me that many of the major policymakers behind that war were interested, and they said this, in extending the New Deal to Asia across the world. And that's what they're, they they actually called it. They said they wanted the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, on the Mekong Delta. That was a famous line by I think LDJ actually. So they wanted to extend what America had become by 1965, you know, to the world, including Vietnam, mm -hmm. and by force of arms if necessary, you know. So it was actually, it was a pure and true imperialism, and I don't want you to take that away from them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's true, How, but I think my point was early on, according to the documents, they saw that um, any kind of realistic, plausible victory, quote-unquote victory, uh, is not going to turn Vietnam into uh, Boston, v Boston, right. say, Cambridge. Right. Uh, and yeah, we would prefer Cambridge, wouldn't we? If we're in the Kennedy administration. Yeah. And our extrication from this mess is going to be ugly, but we're going to keep dropping bombs relentlessly and keep increasing troops because to just leave and admit that we can't achieve these things would be a humiliation. Right. In their words. Right. I mean, we're the king and the king can't be humiliated in any lose. way. It shows weakness. In yeah. And once you show weakness, although I guess, I mean, we did show weakness in the 60s and 70s by losing to a bunch of barefoot peasants. And you're saying that that did not transmit, though. Yeah. I mean, look to the rest of the barefoot peasants. Uh, what was Especially Nixon's, in the Middle East. They didn't hear that message too well. Nixon, peace with honor. Right. Which is another way of saying make losing hurt less. Mm hmm. You know, yeah. by dropping additional bombs, yep. killing more of you. Uh, well, more. So it's more. I mean, it's very clear in the Obama doctrine. And people need to be taking the Obama doctrine more seriously. It's a big deal. I think it's a major turn in American foreign policy. It sort of began with Bush, but he really made it into a doctrine, right? Which was heavy use of air power, especially drones, to reduce the risk of casualties on our side, right? And special ops do all the actual shooting. And that's, a, that's, that's American foreign policy right now, right? In yeah. every country, pretty much, we're doing that in one way or the other, right? Mm -hmm. There's somebody with a U.S. uniform in almost every country right now. Yeah. Um, but they're always, if they're actually killing people, it's either through drones or, or a very cool-looking dude from the movies 
with his flak suit on. Yeah, and, and traditional air power. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, and straight up bombing from planes. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's a that's a thing. The Obama is that not the Obama doctrine that he pretty much put into place? That is a large part of what the eight years of Barack Obama's foreign policy was. Uh, it's referred to as the light footprint. Um, and it contrasts with Bush's, uh, at least the first uh, term of Bush, yeah. who, where uh, we were... Whoops. Here's Vietnam again. Let's right. not do that again. You're much more fine Obama was like, well, huge now you people, wars. you know, this is not an intelligent war. Right. Um, but, part, uh, you know, a large... One of the problems that we've seen now with that strategy is that it drives U.S. foreign policy into the shadows. And even the mm. pretense of receiving congressional authority for bombing another country or sending in special operations troops or sending in regular combat ground troops is even the pretense, even the suggestion that you need to ask Congress for approval is, is laughed at because we can do this quietly with a light footprint. We only need to ask Congress and tell the public about it if we're sending in 100,000 troops to another country. Right. Right? It makes no sense. But it's really, really detrimental, I think, to our It system. keeps it out of the news. And the more we keep it out of the news, news, the more we can keep it going. Right. The more it's not like Vietnam, which was always in the news and on TV. And this is the other thing. We need to get reporters in the field with cameras, don't we? This is what we're really missing. I think more than anything else, that might be the key to everything. We simply don't have those cameras on the battlefields anymore, as we did in Vietnam. I think that's, well, we know it's not an accident, right? We know that they stopped doing that because of Vietnam. Yeah. We got to get cameras. And is that is that even a possibility? I mean, are journalists talking about that? Is there... Are they complaining about it? Is it, I mean, in this in this town, is anybody worried about that? So I think uh, before the Iraq War officially ended, say before Obama's withdrawal in twenty at the end of twenty eleven, there was already a recognition that the um, the version of covering a war where the journalist gets embedded with troops, as they were often in the first Gulf War. Uh, that is wrong, and we're not going to do that anymore. And there's, I think there is and has been a pretty uh, violent shift away from that. And, and reporters, even if they get embedded with, with troops, um, which happens less on a light footprint strategy anyways, um, uh, understand the inherent blind spots and biases and, uh, that, that go along with that kind of uh, approach. I, I mean, I rely on journalism every day. It's getting done. I, I, I doubt that it's the key, as you suggest. Um, it's not getting done. I don't see... I mean, I haven't seen Yemeni children on TV. Oh, I have. Oh. Well, I don't watch I mean, TV. You, but, uh, I mean, you, okay, you can see them if you watch, if you go to the Al Jazeera website, sure. But I mean, they're not on the NBC Nightly News. They're not on CNN. They're not on... Right? It's Tom Brokaw or Don Lemon now, whoever it is, yeah. is not giving us those pictures. Right. I mean, if any, if, if there are Americans out there who want to learn about the world, the worst thing they can do is watch cable news. Oh, yeah. You can only unlearn things. You can only get dumber or more wrong by watching those, mm -hmm. those shows. And so they give a profoundly distorted view of what's happening in the world, what's newsworthy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you pick up a newspaper, I mean, uh, I, in December, I had, um, I had an event here on Yemen, hmm. on our support of the Saudis in Yemen. And I think... There, there was utter silence and um, uh, sort of a whitewash constantly of this conflict for years since it started until I think two events happened. One, if you you might remember, there was a uh, light laser guided bomb that the Saudis dropped on a school bus mm -hmm. carrying, and it killed forty some odd children. That got on the cable networks mm. because it was you could see the twisted metal and mm. the mangled bodies and there that is. that got on there the networks. Yep. That's right. Uh, the other the other I think point at which uh, the conflict got a lot of attention was when the New York Times published a lengthy report, part of which uh, provided photographs of emaciated children who were starving to death as a result of the blockade. Um, 
those two events and then a lot of other things in here in Washington, I think have partially succeeded in getting Congress to assert its authority on this question. Yeah. And, and we, we just saw that yesterday. And we got one good vote on it, right? Right. And so I'm right. It's about getting cameras in the field. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I'm right in saying that it, it, it occurs. <laughs> it's out there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, but yeah. I think it's the two oceans. I think it's the Pacific and the Atlantic buffering us from all the bad stuff in the rest of the world and our relative affluence. That combination has just made us nice and comfortable and apathetic about what our government is doing elsewhere. I mean, it's pretty simple. Yeah. And actually, that speaks to one of the problems with how the international system is set up right now. We have such outsized power and we're so insulated from foreign threats. We really face no threats. Yeah. Terrorism is not a threat. Hmm. It's a minor and- Wait, we, th we face no threats? No. What do you mean? Russia has nuclear missiles, right? So what? What do you They're mean? They're not gonna use them against us. Okay, why not? Because of mutually assured destruction, because they have no motivation to, because it wouldn't serve any national interest that they conceivably have. I mean, you would need to have, you need to get a psychopath mm -hmm. in power that was smart enough to consolidate power domestically. Well, it's a good thing they never did that before, the right. Russians. <laughs> well, I, I think it's, so in the, way, in the ways that people, that IR people tend to talk about threats, you know, threats in the conventional realm from, from conventional militaries abroad, non-state actor threats, right? Uh, these kind of things. Uh, traditionally, the kinds of things that you worried about an invasion or uh, a bomb being dropped. No country in the world is going to drop a nuke on the United States because that country would mm -hmm. be immediately incinerated. Right. So, yeah, we, do, we basically face no threats. We are in a position of fundamental security. Part of that is the oceans. We have geographic isolation. We have weak and pliant neighbors to our north and south. Yep. We have one of the strongest militaries in the world, probably the strongest, uh, biggest economy in the world, nuclear weapons. Nobody can touch us. Yep. And the rational, hmm. reasonable, and just foreign policy for a country in that position is to not do much abroad, not to excessively intervene uh, in virtually every country's internal politics, uh, often violently, and spend, you know, in the past 30 years, this period of fundamental security where we didn't even face an enemy like the Soviet Union, <clears throat> we spent about $15 trillion on the military. Wow. We've engaged in more individual military interventions in this past 30 years than we had in the preceding 190 years of our existence as a nation. Hmm. Those numbers come from the Congressional Research Service. Wow. Um, uh, two out of every three years since the end of the Cold War, we've been in a state of war. Yeah. Something more than 40% of Americans currently living have lived more than half their lives in a state of war. Wow. Right. So, Right. We, are, we are an incredibly hyperactive military power, hmm. and the fact that we're extremely safe from external threats is a conundrum. It's a paradox that we have to kind of figure out. Hmm. That was good. Thank you. I, that made me think. Um, you're, you do a lot of work on Russia and China, pretty important places that I'm interested in. The, let's talk about the Belt and Road Initiative in China, which is amazing. I mean, it's just on, the, on one level, whatever you think of the Chinese <clears throat> and communism, it is just an amazing project that's quite successful so far, right? And looks like could transform at least that half of the planet, potentially. What do you make of it? What do you think the, their intentions are? I mean, do I need to be nervous about it? Trump's very nervous about it, or at least he was. I'm not nervous about it. I'm sure <laughs> I figured. Um... <laughs> No, I mean, I, you might be a little bit uh, overly positive about the prospects of, uh, of how transformational this will be. Okay. Um, it's a lot of ports, a lot of railroads, a lot of roads. Yeah, and that will help uh, with some trade issues. It'll help uh, ensure China's access to a number of important uh, commodities abroad, particularly energy. Uh, uh, it might enhance... Uh, China's relationships and leverage over other countries by some marginal amount. But uh, the project, as it currently is, is facing huge cost overruns. Can you just do a brief description? I didn't really do a good job sure. of that. Can you tell, I mean, just 
give a yeah it's it's asia europe north africa but what actually is it it's a huge infrastructure project that china is um, asking other countries to cooperate in and to join them in where they'll build railroads and pipelines and uh, just regular roads in order to facilitate uh, trade largely the one that the one that scares me a little bit is the ports right why does that scare you well you, you have you have a navy if you have a navy you can go to the ports if you control the ports you can control the city where the ports are you know i mean it's so it's a big deal china has not much in the way of a blue water navy they have mm-hmm. enough they have a strong enough navy to um exercise some measure of dominance in their own sphere, in their own like backyard. The, like the South China Sea. South China Sea. Which and, Trump is very worried about. Yeah, and the, uh, you know, the, what they, what they called before the first island chain, you know, basically along the Asian littoral, they, they can throw their weight around with their Navy, but they're not there yet to be able to have a global hmm. naval presence and use that as leverage to, as you said, control other cities. Hmm. The Belt and Road Project is facing huge cost overruns. Hmm. There's, uh, corruption problems. Mm. Uh, China has repeatedly asked the private sector to help fund this project, and they can't get any money. Mm. And that's probably a good indication that it's not all that economical, which shouldn't be surprising since decisions about the project are being made based on political calculations of the Communist Party and not uh, <laughs> economics. Right. And so uh, there's a there's a possibility that this this project, which is uh, driving so much fear in your head and in most of Washington, um, <laughs> it will just be a huge strategic blunder on China's part. I don't know. I'm like 60% excited and 40% scared. Okay. I just, the good news is that the Chinese have a pretty good track record in terms of intervention, you know, meaning they tend not to be yeah. interventionist. <clears throat> Generally, you know, the current leadership. I don't. I don't know. What do you think of President Xi in this whole thing? I mean, what's what's his? He seems like a different kind of guy, as a Ch- Chinese communist leader, yeah. and very aggressive, more so than they have been internationally. Yeah. Um, what What do you think? What's he up to? So he's uh, he's definitely different than his uh, most immediate few predecessors. He uh, has exercised more power domestically. Um, he has been more assertive uh, in foreign policy. Um, and I think probably to some extent that is just commensurate with the growth in Chinese power uh, mm-hmm. over the past decade or two. Um, but there's also some backlash to that. So pe- a lot of people have recognized that what you just said, which is that she is a different kind of leader and, and, and one that... Um, is a bit more willing to uh, uh, be assertive in the international stage. Uh, and I think there's been enough backlash against that, including in the regional countries, you know, China's regional neighbors, the pushback and the counterbalancing that's taking place. But also, you know, I, th- I think China, people in Beijing were just as surprised about um, the 2016 election, as most Americans were. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they see a much more pugnacious, Hmm. protectionist, um, and assertive in some ways guy in the White House now. And so I think they're they're trying to recalibrate a little bit. Hmm. You're not really answering the question. What is the question again? So, I mean, our country has a big military, big economy, and it's run by a bunch of guys over 200 years who have had this idea that the world belonged to them mm-hmm. and that, that the world would be better off if it was under their care, mm-hmm. right? Now, I don't know exactly why that is, why we have those people, but why can't China, with its very large economy and eventually will have a very large military, why couldn't they have crazy imperialists like that too who have these megalomaniacal ideas yeah. about being the monarchs of the world and being the next Caesar? Why couldn't that guy have a Chinese name? Yeah, they might, um, but there are, there are reasons to doubt that's in the cards in the immediate in the in, in the foreseeable future. So, um, for example, uh, let's let's back up. Why is there peace right now? 
I mean, I know we're talking a lot about U.S. military action and wars and nasty stuff that's going on currently, but historically speaking, uh, this is a time of, of peace. Relative. The rate of interstate war yep. has gone down. The rate of civil wars has gone down, even though there was an uptick in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War. Uh -huh. um, battle deaths, av average battle deaths are down. Um, why? You know? The Obama doctrine. We already discussed this. Right. So some people will say it's U.S. foreign policy. We've right. made the world more stable, mm -hmm. more peaceful, more prosperous, et cetera. Uh, I can talk about why that's wrong. But there's mm -hmm. a, but that's a dominant uh, consensus view in D.C., not in the academy. Right. Uh, you look in the academy, there's a lot of various explanations that's for this. Right. So this period, which they sometimes call the long peace, 1945 on, <laughs> also coincides with the introduction of nuclear weapons. Uh, it also, so there are nuclear peace theorists. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenneth Waltz was one of these guys who says, basically, in general, more nuclear weapons are good because they pacify interstate relations. Mm. Um, and no state uses them, really, except for the one time we did. Um, and uh, that creates peace. Some people look at the nuclear peace theorists and say, Okay, but that's probably overkill. Conventional power alone, the, the destructive capacity of modern post-industrial uh, uh, economies uh, is so great, the destructive potential, that it can destroy entire civilizations. It can upend empires. It can destroy states, as we saw in the First and Second World, World War. Um, and so they say conventional power alone is enough to dissuade states from choosing war, especially with other great powers, because the costs are just too high. Mm -hmm. Other scholars look at economic interdependence and say, you know, that, that old saw about, you know, uh, when, bo when goods cross borders, armies won't. Or, you know, the other way of saying is that if you rely on um, – another country for a lot of trade and employment and, and, and things like this, you don't want to bomb them because it'll be economically irrational, it will damage your, your, own, um, your own economic prospects. But even related to that, there's this notion that if you just stay at peace and trade with other countries, you can obtain and achieve your national interests more effectively and more efficiently and more productively than you could by just choosing to go to war. Mm. Still other people look at the dramatic normative shift that's taken place over the past 100 or so years. So you go back 100 years, you can find leaders in this country and in Europe and all over the place talking about war as something to aspire to. It was a mm. cleansing yeah. national experience yep. that made people, made a nation virtuous and manly. And these days, even the warmongers among us talk about war as something of a last resort. That's true. And that might mark a normative shift in the same way that there's been a normative shift um, away from chattel slavery, which was a, basically a permanent fixture of human yep. societies uh, throughout. Or the fact that nobody today in Western countries has a dispute with their neighbor and decides, let's have a duel to figure it out. <laughs> nobody does that. Mm -hmm. And some scholars think that war is kind of going the way of dueling and chattel slavery. And uh, it just morally... People understand that it's uh, a barbarity and a savagery wow. and that we should back away from it. Um, but th the point is there's a lot of theories about why there is relative peace mm -hmm. these days. And all of them working together in tandem in the same direction make things like a return to an era where we are engaging in territorial conquest or... Um, the kind of old as opposed to neo-imperialism of the United States, uh, that is unlikely. And therefore, uh, even if China gets a, 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 a dictator that's revisionist and power-hungry and uh, belligerent, they, have, they operate in an environment of constraints. And that allows us to be somewhat sanguine about the prospect that China is going to present a direct and imminent threat to the national security of the United States in the foreseeable future. Did you say what your position is on the long peace? I take a small C Catholic view. Uh -huh. uh, I think all of those theories have merit. There okay. are others too. Uh, okay. Democratic peace theory, etc. cetera. Um, hmm. I wish I had my own firm opinion. What I can be sure about is that 
the security argument that American grand strategy in this period is what has led to the decline of war and uh, the prosperous state that things are in, I, that's, that's yeah. wrong. Okay, so they annihilated the enemy, Germany, Japan, annihilated, took over the countries, essentially, with our military, and have occupied them essentially ever since, uh, which also sealed off Western Europe and sealed off the Pacific Ocean from the commies. And we built giant, the biggest military wall ever on yeah. both sides, right? Yeah. And we've had this pretty nice playground in between for the 60 odd years or whatever it is, right? So that seems like that's the liberal internationalist argument that I'm making. I think they're right. Mm -hmm. I think they're right that that's that what we've had is a relative piece. We haven't had world wars like one and two, mm -hmm. although you could argue that the drug war, by the way, is actually World War Three. And I'm starting to argue that mm -hmm. now that I've been actually experiencing it like internationally um, as a reporter. But uh, no, we haven't had the mass killing like World War One and World War Two yet. So I think that is because of the Pax Americana. I think it's because we just built this giant castle, you know, in the middle of the globe. And we had this zone, this free, relatively free zone to play in. Mm -hmm. Now, so you can take that analysis and then still have a very different politics because you could see also that it's cost us how many trillions of dollars and how many lives and how much resentment and mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, I think that's really... That's it. I mean, it's yes, the imperial project was successful for about a century, but here we are, and are we at the end of it? We might be because it's just too damn expensive mm -hmm. and unwieldy, and that's basically what Trump has been yelling about for not just two years, but mm -hmm. for a long, long time. So why can't it just be that? Why can't it just be, okay, the liberal internationalists had their run, and it was it, it did its thing, and it reshape the world and now this might be the end of it well we'd have to convince them to uh ease their grip mm. on u.s foreign policy right mm. now they basically populate all positions of authority um with the, with the exception of uh, the presidency the exact yeah the, the, the single man at the top <laughs> yeah um <laughs> missing the one the one piece there they populate the entirety of the national security bureaucracy yeah. effectively in in my opinion they populate all the uh think tank uh sort of so do you think trump is like all alone up there he's just got nobody well on foreign policy on foreign policy i really don't think he has anyone yeah really has nobody even uh even miller even stephen miller i don't know i don't he, I, to my knowledge he has not articulated his own set of views on foreign policy publicly ever oh yeah he has yeah he's a trumpian he's a I mean, he's tr trump sort of got his ideas from miller he's a well Immigration ideas, definitely. No, no, no. He's, Miller has. Ideas. Yeah, he's he's said he's against regime change very clearly, but he's for crushing the Islamists. It's classic Trumpism. Okay, I haven't seen those comments from Miller, but and maybe Miller is a is an ally, but Miller is also like a wart oh, yeah. on Trump's back. Oh yeah, and uh, not individually in a place of authority. He's not a Marine Corps general. Yeah, and he's he, he's not a decider on issues of national security and foreign policy. He's a sort of uh, propagandist for Trump's immigration policy. Mostly immigration, yeah. He has stated very clearly his foreign policy position, and it was pure Trumpism. But I agree that he's a minor player now and that everyone else, as far as I can tell, yeah. is one of the old old boy network, you know. So I would be careful, though, to... I, I think people take too much liberty in ascribing a set of foreign policy views to Trump. Okay. I think he has some... Uh, some knee-jerk ideas, yeah. uh, particularly around alliance politics. Uh, if I, I, I'm writing a book with my colleagues about Trump's foreign policy. Yeah, let's do this. I don't like the title. I probably won't like the book. Oh, did I give you the title? I saw it. Oh. And, and I don't approve of it. Okay, sorry. And I'm a little cross with you. Well, hey, well, let's, you, let's you propose something different. I'm happy to send you the manuscript. Well, let's hear the argument. I think I don't like it. Okay. You like you like diplomacy. You're mad at him because he doesn't do enough diplomacy. Well, that's one of the things I don't like about okay. him. Yeah. Why, why, why do you want diplomacy? Uh, because given the state of things at this moment... As given... opposed to just withdrawal, right? There's there's going to war, yeah. there's withdrawing the troops, and mm -hmm. then there's, like, what, there's something else called diplomacy, apparently? What's that? Yeah, so... Uh, you have to take it 
in context. So right now, given that the United States is the most interventionist state in the world, and we're all over the place, if you're a policy analyst arguing for policies, uh, it makes sense to suggest that our approach to the world should emphasize and prioritize peaceful engagement and diplomacy and not military-centric problem, military-centric solutions to every conceivable problem. Mm -hmm. um, despite the problems with it, especially in the lead up to it, the Obama administration's approach to Iran was a pretty solid one. Uh, I, it, I disagree f with the consensus view here in DC that a harsh sanctions policy is what brought Iran to the table and got them to agree to what they agreed to. Mainly, it was the U.S. concession that Iran would be allowed civilian nuclear enrichment, which got the Iranians to say, okay, they're serious, let's make a deal, and we can make additional concessions so long as you do. But, I mean, you can kind of contrast the Bush, the, the Bush administration and the Obama administration were both concerned about nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. You can make an argument that Obama was more concerned about that being used as a pretext by other people to do a ground war in Iran like they did with Iraq, because there are those people here in this in hmm. this town that want to do that. But one approach is to... I'm sorry, there are people in this town who want to do what? Go to war with Iran. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right now, like Bolton, et right. cetera. Yeah, sure. And Mattis, probably. So one, one approach is to go in there with the military and cause all kinds of problems, or sit around a table and say, here's what we'll agree. And... Uh, just the sitting down alone, as we've seen with North Korea, I think, is enough to uh, satiate uh, and mitigate the warlike passions that tend to erupt when you don't talk to your adversaries. But the title is something about how Trump made America's foreign policy, even broken worse. foreign policy, even worse. Yeah. How, that is wrong. Really? Yeah, that's just wrong. It's, it's, right, give me it's, the case. It's a little bit better. That's that's the that's the grade he gets. He's made it a little bit better, not worse. What's uh, examples <laughs> where he he's made it better? Well, the normative. I mean, he crashed right into the norm, right? Of we are the global policeman, we are the global superpower, the hegemon. I mm -hmm. mean, he right away in his campaign, he started just hammering away at that. And I think you you told me before we started recording that you've been meeting people in mm -hmm. D.C. who are in the think tank world who are not libertarian types who are starting to change their minds about. America. Yeah, not because Trump persuaded them on the merits. But you did though. say, I thought you told me that there was kind of a, a, Trump, a Trump effect. A yes. Trump effect. Yes. People are terrified okay. at the notion that a guy like this could uh, have ultimate control Yay. over nuclear weapons, et cetera. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a good awesome. thing. That's a positive development. Yeah. But it's not foreign policy. It's politics. That's politics. I agree. And everything Trump said that would be kind of good to your ears in the campaign and as president mm -hmm. has been uttered and not implemented. Uh, well, excuse me, he just withdrew troops from Syria. Uh, so he tried to withdraw troops from Syria after quadrupling the number of troops that Obama had in there. Um, did he? he the, yes. Quadrupled the ground troops? Yes. Okay. From 500 to 2,000. I did not know Is that. Is that quadruple? That, yeah. That makes sense. I, I so guess he, it makes sense, yeah. He first, just like he increased troops in Afghanistan before saying, let's get out. And this was t this was the final push against the towns that ISIS still held in eastern Syria, right? They, yeah. they held a few towns and cities in eastern Syria, and there was a big, last year, the U.S. directed this big assault on those towns, wiped yeah. out ISIS, really just crushed them. We don't, and there's not, I haven't seen a single piece of video. Have you seen any video of that? Of those hardly, battles? Hardly. Right? That's what I'm talking about. These yeah. are major urban battles, right? Yeah. Got to be thousands of people dead from that and wounded. And I haven't seen a, a single video yeah. from even Al Jazeera. It's ridiculous. Anyway, they were successful, basically drove ISIS out of all those towns and cities. Now they're just in one little tiny stronghold in southeast Syria on the Iran Iranian border, right? Mm -hmm. and there's like, what, a couple hundred? Not Iranian border. Uh, uh, Iraqi border, maybe? Iraq. Uh, yes, Iraqi border, yes. Um and there's like, a, what, a couple hundred left ISIS fighters and the U.S. is leading the Kurds so and they say. killing them, maybe. We don't even know. Um, so I'll throw you a bone. He did, it. he did try to push the executive branch to agree to a full withdrawal from Syria. Yeah. The current policy is now not a full withdrawal. Bolton, Pompeo, and others got him to agree to leave a residual force of a few hundred, yep. several hundred. Yep. Uh, along with 
private contractors that mm -hmm. are in there and along with a continued air campaign. Yeah. So that was his concession. That was his concession about Trump being a pacifist with regard to Syria, <laughs> yeah. withdrawing from the conflict. He's not withdrawing. He's not withdrawing the air campaign. He's not. The stopping. guy's got a lot to go against. You, you're the one who told us that right. everyone in this town is against him on foreign policy. What I'm suggesting is that we need to be careful about what Trump says and the politics around what he says, uh, and just make that ensure that we are. We make a distinction between that and what our foreign policy actually is. Right. Because it is not reflective of some of the more non-interventionist impulses that Trump has articulated. Oh, let me be really clear. Donald Trump is a mass murderer, okay? He's just killed fewer people. He's just, you know, I don't know. Well, Charles civilian Manson casualties have gone up Ted Bundy or whatever. Civilian casualties uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan increased 215% in Trump's first year and a half. I, okay. So if you look at those numbers, it's it's in the summer of last year, they spike, mm -hmm. when it's, which is when they're taking out those towns and cities I was talking about, right? And then they just dropped off entirely by the end of the year. And the civilian casualties, I believe, are way down since then, since that big campaign against ISIS. Right? Well, we don't have those numbers yet. Okay. Uh, but what we know is that in 2017 and 2018, uh, the r incidence of civilian casualties went up massively yeah. in Iraq and Afghanistan. He was finishing Obama's job. Yeah, they had gone. They had been a, a huge spike. It was a ground campaign. In Obama's last year. Yep. And, and Trump just continued. It, but it was that. the same campaign against yes. ISIS. Yes. Right. That Obama started. Same campaign. Same strategy, etc. Yeah. What Trump did do is loosen the rules of engagement slightly, so that. Uh, People who decide to bomb and where right. don't take to have don't have to take the precautions that Obama at least slightly insisted on. Right. Uh, but you're right, spike in civilian casualties in Obama's last year and the first two years of Trump's uh, presidency they went massively up. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that he's necessarily on track to uh, cause less death uh, and kill less people, fewer people. But the point is he didn't he hasn't withdrawn from Syria mm -hmm. and he still hasn't. Not totally. The but mostly. ground troops that we he has now agreed to keep there, why are they there? First of all, they don't have congressional authorization, mm -hmm. so they're illegal. Right. They don't have authorization from the UN Security Council, so they're in violation of international law to the extent that we care about that. Uh, they are there to push back against Iran and Russia. Uh, I don't know when anybody said that that was allowed. Why is that allowed? Are they there under the authority that the administration says say they're there they're under, which is the AUMF, the 2001 AUMF, which said with authorized the Bush administration to go after Al Qaeda? Um, no, Al Qaeda doesn't exist there. The people that were actually fighting are enemies with Al Qaeda, and they don't present a direct threat to us. So all of these things make it totally illegitimate that we're there at all. Uh, and yes, Trump made an effort. And Ob I, you could say the same thing about Obama in oh, yeah. several respects. It's his campaign. He made certain efforts to be less um, less like Bush, in, in a sense. And uh, both of them so far have failed. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, I mean, he's not gone nearly as far as I would like, but he has, as I said, made things a little bit better. Not worse. Okay, let's continue the conversation. I think I so, beat you on the Syria question. So there's no, you didn't, because there were 2,000 troops a year ago, and Which now there's he 200. Put in there. He put in there. I know, and there was a spike in civilian casualties, for sure, and then he withdrew almost all of them. But that was a campaign. I'm not saying it's good. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying it's slightly better than what was happening before. In other words, Nixon... It's the same as what was happening under Obama. In other words, to me, it's very similar to Vietnam, actually. I mean, you've got Johnson doing the big buildup, and it's his, it's his war. It's his campaign. Yeah. He's got the big buildup. And then Nixon just finishes it by killing everybody. But he finishes it. And mm -hmm. then he withdraws, right? On a smaller scale, that's what Obama and Trump have done. Maybe. We'll have to see. We'll have to see how it goes in Syria. I think, I, I think that's right. What, I, think, I think I just figured that out. What tends to happen, <laughs> and I think you'll know this as, okay. since you're studying Vietnam, yeah. if you have a small contingent of forces, the incentives to increase that contingent mm -hmm. or get yourself tangled up in a situation where you have to use more force or introduce more forces is very highly likely. Oh, yeah. It's very unlikely, in fact, that mission creep won't be a factor if we have a con small contingent of forces there, which Trump has now permanently, indefinitely agreed to. Yeah. No, I, I mean, 
I think that's the blob winning, though. I don't think that was Trump's idea to keep those people there. I'm sure it was John Bolton's idea and Mattis's idea and all those guys. Who Again, you, who you make, talked about. I make the distinction between what Trump says, the weird things that go on in his head, yeah. and what policy is. That's an yeah. important distinction, and that's why we phrased our, our title that way, our book's title. Okay. Um, but I don't want to be too against you here. There are certain factors that make uh, Trump's presidency unique and possibly pivotal for the that's whole... That's it. That's the word. Yeah. I think that's what it is. It's possible. Now, a pivot can be bloody and awful, mm-hmm. which this one is. I mean, and, uh, although compared to a lot of other presidents, he's, his body count's probably going to be low, I think, actually. Um, but he's still a mass murderer. But I do think it's pivotal because he made this normative attack mm-hmm. or an attack on the norm of the superpower. Yeah. I mean, that's a big deal. And he got a lot of people excited about that for a while. Not anymore, but for a while there, I mean, in a positive way, a lot of people voted for him because of that. He went to South Carolina and gave a speech that was like Ron Paul. Yeah, it was to a presidential debate. To a Republican yeah. military audience, yeah. right? And he was a straight up anti-interventionist speech. It was very Ron Paulian, was it not? Yeah, I mean, he essentially... Uh, uttered some slogans about no more regime change and no more. You're not giving this guy any <laughs> well any credit. <laughs> he also happens to be an idiot. You know, I don't uh, think that's true either. Really? I think no, no. Well, how is he an idiot? I would need to see some evidence that he has dealt with the issues that he now has ultimate authority over in some at, at some level of intellectual sophistication, as opposed to the the literally toddler level understanding that he has of most issues. I mean, he can't even keep his facts straight. On NATO, he still thinks that this situation is, is one in which NATO countries hand us some cash in return for, that, that there are dues to mm. be paid. Mm. He doesn't understand NATO. Mm. He's not an intelligent person. <laughs> he admits that he doesn't read books. Everyone around him that has dared to be honest about it uh, speaks to this notion that he just doesn't have a, a serious intellectual grasp over the issues that he now has authority over. Okay, let me, let, me, let me lay this out and see if this makes sense. I think there is a Trump, Trumpian or Trumpist foreign policy, and I think it's coherent, and I think it's, I think it's logical. It's not mine, mm-hmm. but I think it makes sense. And it's, it borrows from other ideas, but it's, it's its own thing, which is this. We avoid regime change, war we 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 avoid long standing occupations uh we get the job done when we have to and we get a job we we get it do- we sorry we get it done completely and totally and immediately this is similar to the Weinberger doctrine and the Colin Powell doctrine uh and it be, was sort of the Reagan doctrine at the end of Reagan's presidency right and i think that's it i mean it makes sense to me and it really is appealing especially to people in the military because it's this idea of using overwhelming force, but only when necessary. So only when the United States is directly attacked in a real way. I think this is what Trump believes. Should we use military force? But when we do, we wipe them out the way we've done with ISIS. Yeah. The Jacksonian. Yeah. 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 The, the scorched earth approach, but only when necessary. That was what Casper Weinberger advocated under Reagan. And that is very much, I think, what Trump believes. Well, um, it's not my it's, it's not my cup of tea. It's really I'm just hard. saying yeah, it's, it's its own thing, though, and it's I think it's logically coherent. This is the this is the actual problem because it is hard to tease out a coherent strategy from Trump because he's just first of all he's not coherent when he talks about foreign policy. He constantly contradicts himself. His statements don't match his policy. Never mind his previous statements, right? Uh, and so it's very very hard. And I think people. Uh, most people who say they know what Trump's foreign policy vision is uh, are helping themselves along in their own head, <laughs> figure it out, and mapping their own preferences oftentimes <laughs> or not preferences. What are you saying about me, John? To, right? So yeah. what, here's what I can say. I hear you. There is not, I don't think that he has a strategic vision of any kind that we can tease out. Exactly. Coherently. That's why I like him. Okay. But what he does have but, is certain impulses. Right. We don't want strategic vision. So what do you have? So, well. We don't. I mean, not, no. 
We want just to get out. Right. But there is a strategic vision, a longstanding one with, a, with, a, with an impressive pedigree in both academia and history uh, that, can, that is the intellectual and strategic basis for getting out. Oh, yeah. I don't think of it as a strategy, though. I think of it as a, an impulse or an orientation yeah. or an attitude. Like, I don't have a strategy for foreign I think policy. What, I just want to get out. I think what colors is uh, his ideas on foreign policy essentially four things. And we lay this out in the book. Uh, one is very zero-sum transactional thinking. Uh, so he believes that if you trade with a country uh, or you have, you have a trade deficit with a country, yeah, that's a loss. He, and he thinks that, you know, immigrants coming in, taking American jobs, that's a zero-sum loss, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think... Uh, uh, that's how he thinks, and that that leads to a very a preference for bilateralism as opposed to multilateralism. He he likes to deal one on one with countries because we have more leverage. So I think he's very very zero sum transactional. Mm -hmm. The second thing I think he's uh, very Jacksonian, and this speaks to the the feeling that you articulated mm -hmm. where he he won't he he'll he doesn't want really involvement and entanglement, but if you if you press him and if you are a threat, he'll come in with overwhelming force. Right. Uh, another one is status. And this I, I'm connected to my other research, but I think it's clear. I have a book back there, which essentially it's by two, I think, British historians who uh, just collected basically every public statement interview uh, speech that Trump gave from 1987 hmm. to, to the 2016 campaign. And what you find is over and over and over again, he says, they're laughing at us. They're taking advantage of mm. us. Um, these countries, they think we're suckers. Mm. They think we're losers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, he even said in an interview um, that this country needs more ego. Other countries are beating us on ego, right? He's very, very status, prestige, honor, right? That matters to him. And that's why he really doesn't like us guaranteeing the security of other countries because number one, zero sum transactionalism, it's our money and our resources that are going to these to the defense of these countries, but also they're getting a deal and we're the suckers. Mm -hmm. So that's another huge thing for him, I think. Uh, and the, the, the last one would be an authoritarian mindset. Uh, I think he tends to have an authoritarian mindset and that has all kinds of implications for how a leader deals with his inner circle on national security decisions, uh, how he manages his team, uh, the kinds of actions he decides to take and not take, et cetera. I think at, at my best attempt to really draw his foreign policy ideas, they basically fall into those four categories. Okay. Uh, I don't think he has a coherent strategic vision of any kind. So who do you think is calling the shots up there? I think it's a messy process and not really easily yeah. um, put in those terms. Uh, I think that he faces a ton of pressure, but it's also, um, it's also just the nature of the beast. This was the case with, with Obama too. Uh, he, he tried to do certain things and got a lot of pushback from the so-called blob, the, the uh, vast network of professional foreign policy people in Washington, D.C., uh, both in and out of government, which all, they all basically agree that we should have this foreign policy that we have. And, uh, yeah, they put pressure on him, uh, on the president if they, he feels otherwise. So what's diplomacy going to get us? What kind of diplomacy are you talking about? Are, are there specific issues that you think can be resolved in favor of non-interventionism through diplomacy or what? Like what is Sure. So I think there was I think there there was a good non-interventionist case uh if we're going to buy into the the, re, the real world and the way that it is for mm -hmm. the Iran nuclear deal. Couldn't have done that without without diplomacy. Um I think Trump has walked us back from the brink of war that he walked us up to with North Korea by saying, "Yeah, we'll talk to him." Hmm. Why shouldn't you talk to people? Uh, uh, I think in all kinds of areas, if we choose to just sit down at the table with our adversaries, the likelihood of us going to war is less. And uh, 
even beyond that, I mean, diplomacy, you can get all kinds of things with diplomacy. You can get free trade deals. Um, you can get uh, cooperation with other countries in other ways that you wouldn't otherwise have, et cetera. Uh, I think it's a, it's a value if you're going to have a state that conducts any kind of foreign policy. The thing is, diplomacy is conducted by people who wear suits, so I'm not interested. Right. I'm wearing a suit. I know. We talked about that when I walked into this think tank here. Like, everybody's wearing suits, right? And D.C. <clears throat> That's what the diplomats do. They wear suits and they sit down at tables and they carve up the world and draw lines and organize people into nations. So that's why I'm a little nervous about diplomacy. You know, that's the history of diplomacy in the 20th century, right? Mm -hmm. Was after the big wars, a bunch of guys in suits would sit at a table and say, okay, you, you, you're now Czech and you're now Polish and you're now Russian and you're now this and that, right? Yeah. So I am, the, the, the idea of Donald Trump and James Mattis and John Bolton sitting at a table with anybody or the Democrat or Kamala Harris or Beto O'Rourke or any of them doesn't sit well with me. Uh, I'm interested only in one thing, getting out. And so I'm interested only in yelling it at them mm -hmm. from outside of Capitol Hill in my t-shirt Yeah. until they have to listen. Right. And I don't know how long that'll take. I don't know what that will take, but I get that we need people up here in suits doing the talking, I suppose, for us, but they're not going to listen until there's more crazies like me outside of Capitol Hill creating a different kind of pressure, right, for a real anti-interventionist foreign policy, which yeah. I think we actually, now there's a chance we could get. I think Trump was an opportunity to build a, a new alliance or a coalition mm -hmm. around anti-interventionism on the left and the right, bringing them together for the first time around that which is it was squandered for various reasons, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. It could be rekindled, I think. So I think there's reason to hope. I also know, I completely agree with you that this town is just nothing but interventionists and they believe it in their bones, right? But I think the country outside this bizarre place that we're sitting in is uh, much closer to you and me than, than to the blob. Yeah, I mean, look at, the, look at the way the past four presidents have talked about foreign policy during the campaign. Uh, Bill Clinton uh, talked about um, domestic things, mainly. Uh, George Bush came into office saying things like uh, humble foreign policy, no nation building, yep. got elected. Yep. Obama got elected largely because of his opposition to the Iraq War. Yep. And Trump got elected saying no more regime change wars. Yeah. So I think you're right that uh, the, the American people are closer to us than, than the blob. Um, but, you know, I think the short term is important too. And to the extent that we can create certain habits here in D.C. that lean towards diplomacy and away from the use of force... I'll take that as a short-term gain sure. uh, rather than – I mean, I'll, I'll be with you screaming if we are ever close to really – So here's what people don't know. John is our secret agent. <laughs> we finally got one up here. <laughs> you used to work at antiwar.com yeah. four years ago, which is crazy because antiwar.com is as radical as it gets on the antiwar left or right. And has been consistently that for a long, long time. And so that you came from there to here is, is funny and unusual. And that's why I'm talking to you. Yeah. But, and so I'm glad you're here. I just think, and you, you understand this, but I think that ultimately it's going to come down to the streets in a sense, which, you know, is Twitter and Facebook and not just, not just marching in the streets, but it's people talking mm -hmm. and people changing their minds and norms changing. I think when you, when you brought up the normative shift around war, that was fascinating. And I think that's gone on. Yeah. And I think it can go on about the American empire too. I think we can have a change of mind uh, collectively. Now it's a problem because it's 350 million ignorant, fairly stupid people uh, in particular about global affairs. Are they stupid? But there is sort of an inherent, there's an isolationism actually inherent mm -hmm. in American culture. And it's always been there. It's always been in tension with the guys who have won. Right. But it's there, and Trump found it. Mm -hmm. He saw it, and he used it. 
and he fanned that flame a bit. Yeah. So we can get it back. And when we do, you will be Secretary of State. Uh, I don't foresee... Oh, you want defense? Okay, fine. <laughs> any really government job ever. Uh, but I will say that the, the change in position from a radical at a marginalized outlet to a secret radical at a mm. uh, heterodox think tank, but one of the major ones, mm -hmm. has altered my perception on a lot of things and made me question how change actually happens. Mm. Um, I don't have firm answers, but... Um, Uh-oh. Let's hear it. Well, I don't have firm answers. But you're about to make a counter argument, sounds like. I'm, I am not certain how effective I have been in the past with persuading the unpersuaded. And uh, nor am I sure that my current tactic, which is a bit of a softer edge, is more effective. But I have a, I, I suspect maybe it is. Uh, uh, although I'm not sure. Hmm. Much of the change, by the way, if there has been a change, not in my views, but in my delivery of them, has just been a result of this is more academic work. So referring to this or that journal article, this or that IR professor, this or that tradition, and this or that school of thought in academia, and trying to translate that into policy analysis, which is basically my main job, mm -hmm will result in a, in, a, in a different product than me uh, reading intensively primarily journalism, but also some sort of thought leaders and thinkers uh, on foreign policy. Let me ask you this. What do you want? Like, what's your position? Like, do you want immediate withdrawal? Uh, how many troops? All the bases? Some of the bases? What? What are we talking about? How much for the military budget? Lay it out there. Sure. I did write a, a policy analysis. A policy analysis is a, the main study that we release, the main sort of paper that we publish at, at Cato. Uh, my first year in this job, I, I published one uh, on forward deployment on, on overseas bases, and I said, withdraw from all of them. All of them. All of them. Well, I said, you can leave one in Diego Garcia and Guam. Guam is <laughs> U.S. territory anyways. Okay. This was my attempt to be to seem like I'm compromising. <laughs> Because one of the arguments against uh, withdrawing from overseas bases is that it takes longer to get to places if you don't have in-place forces. Sure. Mm -hmm. And my opinion is that's good. That's the point. It sure. should take, exactly. There should be obstacles to right. military intervention. Right. But throwing a bone to the other side and trying not to seem like a total radical, I said, if you just keep them in Guam and Diego Garcia, you'll be able to get places soon. But frankly, most of our most of the interventionism that we engage in is, is not a result of the bases that we have. They're a, the bases are a manifestation of our interventionist yeah, foreign exactly. policy. Yeah. Right. They are places where we have intervened. Right. Yeah. But how many are there now? Well, it depends on what you count as a base, but right. there are bases and facilities, about 800 of them. 800. In about 70 or 80 countries. Semi-permanent places, right, where U.S. military personnel operate from. Right. 800. And you want to close... 798 of them. Right. Where's Diego Garcia again? It's, it's in uh, the Indian Ocean uh, or right before, right in that Indian Ocean. Why area. do you want to give them that? They're already there. I, it's, it, was a, it was an argument to say it's close to... I don't want to give them certain, that. That's too far away. Well, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, okay. But frankly, it was a pipe dream anyways, this, okay, this right. PA. Uh, we're not going to... I don't see us withdrawing from... I mean, we have something on the order of uh, 250 to 300,000 troops overseas at any given point. Wow. Uh, most of them are concentrated in Europe and Northeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And we have right now roughly 60,000 uh, peppered across the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Those are the main theaters. Yeah. Uh, that's where our troops are. And uh, it's a lot. I think tomorrow we should put, you know, close them all down and bring the troops home. Uh, it's not going to happen, but... Uh, it was just sort of tactical. I approach. just want you to say it publicly from a think tank yeah. on Capitol Hill. Oh, I have. You, I have. you just did. 
<laughs> on Capitol Hill, yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, I, yeah, I, right, right. I said that. Um, oh, you mean no, I, in in the Capitol building? Right. Oh, yeah. In a hearing? No, not in a hearing. It was a little. Uh, they have uh, congressional office buildings, and sometimes they have events there on policy right. issues. That uh, it wasn't uh, in front of Congress, but yeah, I, I gave a speech about poor deployment. Cool. Well, I'm with you on that. What about the military budget? Because I don't study the military budget, I don't, I don't have a number for you. But, no, but right now we spend about as much as the next 10 or 12 countries combined, mm-hmm. depending on how you count. Yep. Uh, we don't need to spend anything like that. Uh, as, a, as a rule, if I had a, a wand, I'd cut it in half tomorrow 50. and then see what else we can 50% cut. 50% off the top. Yeah. Right off the top. Yeah, that's what... I know that's what Justin Raimondo used to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said for the beginning... We will just start with fifty percent. Yeah, which is actually that's pretty modest. It's a sizable military budget, even if you cut it in half. Oh yeah, we'll still spend more than China, but the 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 gap won't be uh, as as big. Yeah, I'm with you there too. I think we're good now. Mm-hmm. And I want you to stay here. I was teasing you before, and I was trying to you know provoke you, mm-hmm. but I love that you're here. I love that you're this close to the seats of power and that you have some influence on these people. And I also love that, at least according to you, some people are starting to change their minds in good ways around here. Well, I have no other skills. So oh, I'm yeah? going to ride this pony no. as long as it will not kick me off. Uh-huh. I thought you were going to be like a YouTube star next. <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, I love it. And I'm really glad you're here. And I think you've done amazing work. And thanks for talking to me. Thank you. Was well, this all right? Yeah. Because you said you were worried about it. Uh, it's just my, I have a perpetual no confidence. Oh, really? Yeah, I can't imagine. I would never want to listen to an hour and a half of myself. Oh, okay. Uh, I was just projecting that onto <laughs> other people. No, man, this was great. Thank you so much. It went quicker than I thought. Yeah. Well, we'll do it again. Cool. Thanks. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To support the show and become a member of the Unregistered community, go to unregisteredunderground.com. Thanks for listening.